This is on. Yeah, great. It's not on. Hello? Is this one? That one is on. Take the other one. Then. Now it's right, great. Uh, my name is Robin, and uh, I live and work here. And it's my pleasure to facilitate the dialogue that we have about half an hour to uh, to focus on now. So this is really a space. It may be a space for questions. It may also be a space for you to make your own comment, or um, really to have dialogue. I'm aware that both speakers who are very passionate and eloquent in different ways, I think, but also brought a lot to our, to our session this morning. There wasn't time for questions of either speaker, so it may be that you have questions, but it may also be that you simply wish to make an observation or a comment of your own. Um, I think our hardworking interpreter is going to continue to interpret through this session, but if you have a question in Portuguese, then Deborah, who is sitting here, will um, interpret the question for those of us who are English speakers. So, the space is open. You have a question. There's one here in the front row. Front row here in the end. Yeah. I have a workshop on security, global security, and I'm trying to see the marriage between environmental, economic, spiritual, personal, and what we call military security, because at the moment most people think about security in terms of how many tanks and how many battleships you have and how many helicopter gunships. And yet all these things to me are integrated and must be seen from above. I wondered if you have any kind of guidance to our thinking about our security, which belongs to us all for the future. But it's difficult to give you <coughs> an all-embracing answer to that, because the, t the subject you touched is, includes practically everything. Uh, but uh, when I look at the conventional military thinking, for instance, in Germany, I've often said in talks there, if I was the Minister of Defense here, I wouldn't care a damn for armed forces, for tornadoes and missiles and so on. I would look at our agriculture. That is where we are really uh, vulnerable. And a country like Germany or England or, or whatever cannot be defended militarily anymore. For instance, when, when the Cold War was still on, I often said, suppose the East were to march in. The only reasonable attitude on our part would have been, OK, come in, let's sit at the table, let's talk. Because if we shot back, it would be total holocaust. Look, well, take a country like Germany, and you'll see it's not very different. They have 19 nuclear power stations in there. With conventional weapons, you can make 19 Chernobyl and worse. So you cannot defend modern countries militarily. At best, we need a, a military force for police action, very limited, but not to defend our nation. But we need a healthy agriculture. Today's agriculture is unsustainable. <coughs> Perhaps it might be worth mentioning in 45, when in Germany, everything was totally destroyed. The cities were 80% bombed to, into ruins. And most businesses didn't work. But Germany still had something that it doesn't have today. It had a healthy peasantry. A peasantry that produced, one can even say holistically in this case, yes, because they had something of everything. And then people in the cities could walk out or bike out or go out into the country in the last running trains and barter. And the farmer had something of everything. He had grain, he had meat, he had milk, he had cheese, and so on and so on. If something similar happens today, let's say in Germany, here, or wherever in one of the modern countries, not a single bomb need fall. It is enough for some of our infrastructures to collapse. The banking system, or communication, now the computers, Transportation energy. If any one of these infrastructures collapses, the whole thing collapses. And today, the modern farmer, who is a specialist, 
would also have to go barter for food. But where? The supermarkets would be raped in two days. Yeah? We would die like flies. So if we really want security, we must go for a sustainable economy and not think of bombs and, and planes and so on. Thank you. Christine, would you like to add anything from your perspective? Not at this point, OK. Other questions? Eu estou profundamente tocada pelos dois conferencistas. Eu não sei se alguém vai traduzir. Você? Porque eu vivo um paradoxo. She is very touched for the two conferences because she lives in a paradox. Eu sou doutor na Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro e psicóloga clínica. She is a doctor from the University from Rio de Janeiro, is a clinic psychologist. Então vivo um momento da educação e o um momento da, do tratamento da saúde. She lives a moment of education and a moment of uh, healing treatment. Então, o que eu senti da mensagem ligada à educação, que é tão pouco remunerada no nosso país, tão pouco considerada? What she felt from the, me uh, the message from education that has a low remuneration in, in our country? E, e sinto assim talvez uma responsabilidade maior quer dizer sinto que vou precisar de muito suporte do grupo estou profundamente tocada por isso and so she feels that she needs a, she, she's got a very a, a great responsibility and she needs more support for that e, então gostaria que os dois conferencistas é, aprofundassem mais alguma coisa ligada ao campo da educação quer dizer qual é a perspectiva eh, numa projeção de, de saúde e do que é realmente possível fazer, quer dizer, no sentido de uma esperança? And uh, she wants to know a little deeply uh, what's uh, able to, to do in, in the field of education and healing, what, what it's uh, possible to do. Há um caminho para a nossa juventude, é, eu, eu tenho assim esperança, é uma das coisas que, que ilumina o meu caminho na minha ética, na minha filosofia de vida. Então eu estou esperando alguma palavra de maior apoio para nós educadores. Se houver esperança para os nossos filhos e jovens no terceiro mundo. Thank you very much. Can I just clarify then the question is about some or looking for some support and advice maybe about education and healing and uh, what messages we might give to our children. Would either of you like to comment on that? I would like to say something that I consider of extreme importance in education. We also work in our foundation, we work in ecological education of children, but I want to go a little deeper. Einstein was once asked what is a genius? Because he was considered the greatest genius of the time. And he is supposed to have answered something like, every child of three or four years passes the day making genial questions. The genius is the person who continues to make these questions all his life. Today we have a system of education that every three or four year old child is a genius, unless it has some defect. Sorry. But a genius, the inborn genius of the child is destroyed first in the family, then in kindergarten, then in primary, then in secondary education, and then in university, and most of all in post-graduation. Then they become like that. We have to find ways of making the innate genius of children survive the system. That means changing the system from conformity to open-mindedness. Yeah, today, children are educated for conformity. You must be like the other children. You must not be too different. 
That is quite a challenge for the educational system. Thank you. Christine. Okay. okay. Hello. Hey. Is this on? Would you use this one? Okay. Uh, he, uh, she asked a question on uh, what we are doing about uh, our children today and uh, education. And uh, what is going on at the moment is that, uh, I don't know, I touched about alternative. What alternative are we talking about? Let's go for alternative education, okay? Let's go for alternative education whereby our child can be taught in an alternative way. Uh, the way we normally say that charity begins at home. I'm sorry to give this example. Like uh, my little Kizito, I'm trying to see if he can grow up in alter on an alternative way that he won't be beaten at home so that uh, he doesn't face that, that problem of child beating or the, the fear because then conflict and uh, violence starts at home. Let's, let's try to look for an alternative whereby there is no violence and uh, it is us who are going to do it for our children of tomorrow. If we don't do it, then who will do it? And it is us, okay? So let's look for an alternative way, an alternative curriculum that will make the child, that will give a conducive atmosphere for the child to grow up well and come to like this alternative on education unlike the education that we are having now, that it is just a mainstream line that is strict and has boundaries. Let's open up so that the education is not very strict. It is a bit alternative. You can study near the river. You can study up in the mountain. You can, I don't know, alternative is the word. Thank you. Back here, Sam. I think it's probably easier if you just wait for the mic to arrive there. I'd just like to come back to what Lutz was talking about, and if I may ask the audience a question. Before Lutz told you what he did about economic indicators, how many of you knew how ludicrous the ones that we use are? Could you raise your hand? Do you understand the question? No. Can, can you translate for it? If, what I'm asking is, before they heard what Lutz said, did they realize how ludicrous, how crazy the indicators are? The indicators. Antes de vocês ouvirem o que Lutzenberg said, how many of, quantos de vocês sabiam Thank you. Yeah, can you all raise your hands if you knew before then that they are crazy? Okay. I, I'm asking because I'm interested in educating about um, whole system indicators and the need for that. And there are groups who are doing that. I just would like to add a positive note that, that a lot of people are working on lobbying their governments. The Scottish Parliament now has a big opportunity to do that. Um, and I know in Australia we were doing that. In London there's the New Economics Foundation. There are a lot of people who are aware and working on what Lutz very clearly articulated. If anyone who lives in Scotland would like to follow up more on that, um, please come and see me afterwards. And thank you, Lutz. That was wonderful. Thank you. There's another comment in the middle here. He's French, isn't he? Where's he from? This guy is he French? I know Norwegian, I think. He's Norwegian. Uh, I have a question to you, Jose. Um, if I understood the introduction right, you, you had two years in the Council of, uh, of Environment in the government. Two that, years, I was, yeah. was minister, yes. So my question is uh, two-part. It, it's, to me, it seems like a miracle like a uh, that a person like you is elected. I mean, with a really uh, huge perspective. 
So the question is, how could you be elected to come into such a powerful situation? And how was it, if you could give some images of how it was to work those two years, meeting so many conservative uh, values, I presume? Well, I wasn't elected. <laughs> I was selected. <laughs> <laughs> by the elected president, and he wanted my name, you know. Uh, <clears throat> in reality, he was not really interested in what I had to say, but we did manage to do a few, make a few good things, but on the whole, those two years were the hardest years of my life, because being surrounded by those cynical politicians, people who are so cynical, so cynical, that they cannot accept that somebody is not like that. Yeah, so you can imagine how difficult it is. And while I was in government, I had even my friends, our friends against us, because I couldn't talk. If I wanted, if I wanted to succeed in something, I had to do it behind the, <clears throat> behind the scenes. And I had to put the ideas into the head of the president. It had to come from him, not from me. But still, we did a few things. We, we had Brazil sign the non-proliferation treaty. Our military were just getting ready to make an atom bomb, too. That was a very hard, but tough and tough uh, job. We succeeded in having them abjure the atomic bomb. Maybe now they're rebuilding it, we don't know. We signed the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, moratorium on the whales and on, uh, on uh, the Antarctic, and a few more things, especially in the field of pesticides. Yeah? And uh, we demarcated the territory of the Yanomami, something like the size of Portugal, 90,000 square kilometers. Yeah? We were very seriously criticized for that because the attitude of the technocrat was, how can you give so much land to so few people? Only 2,000 Indians getting a territory as big as Portugal or, or Austria. They are the biggest landlords in the world. But then I heard the same guy say, you know what, actually I think it is a very good thing what you did, because now we can talk to their chieftains and buy their resources, very cheap. <laughs> that is the prevailing attitude. Thank you. <laughs> well, I quit when I, when I realized that uh, there was nothing to do anymore. For the first year and a half I believed in our president, but then I saw that he was not honest. And I had realized that he was going to keep me until the end of the conference, the Rio conference of 92, which I organized on, from the side of the Brazilians internationally. And he was going to sack me after the conference. I said, no, then you have to sack me before. And I provoked him into sacking me. Thank you. The There's a question or a comment over here. Yeah. I was just a little concerned or wanted some feedback on your statement when you said it is not enough to work for our own peace of mind. And I th I'm feeling personally that I've come for an answer to marrying the things that I'm seeing by uh, other people work in a, in a spiritual way to work um, uh, with me through meditation for their own peace of mind and the kind of work that you're doing. I'm inspired utterly by both. But I, I, I feel that they need to be linked, and that's what, for me, this, this is, uh, whole thing is, is uh, so demonstrating that that is actually happening. But it tends, it's tending to be incorporated in, in, in different people. I'm wondering whether, whether it needs to be incorporated, this knowledge that you're saying, together with the peace of mind. And I'd like to give a, just a little bit of background why I'm saying that, because I, I'm an Alexander Technique teacher, and we work with uh, the psychophysical unity. And if there's a specific um, problem, like a, a, a painful shoulder, we work with the whole and the symptom will disappear in the process. So we're attempting no longer to constantly give the attention to the symptom, but to the unity, and then it will disappear in the process, which is, of course, long-term thinking rather than a short-term uh, kind of thinking, and a very wrong way round, way round kind of way of thinking, which uh, is very difficult for many people to grasp when you begin to teach them this. So 
um, I'm, I'm wondering how it can be linked together. If it, is it not really two sides of the same coin that shouldn't, should be working <laughs> very, very closely together and maybe we should be trying to incorporate both in our own persons? And I wonder if you could give me some help on my question about that. Well, you're only confirming what I said in different words. I'm not, I did not say that working for one's peace of mind is bad or is not necessary. It is necessary. But we need both. If I didn't have my peace of mind, if I had not always worked on my peace of mind, I would not be here today. I would not be in this fight. Yeah? But I get my peace of mind from the way I see science. To me, science, a clean dialogue with the universe, with the great mystery, we may call it God or whatever. Science to me is the contemplation of the divine beauty of the universe. And this gives me peace of mind to work until the end. There's two over here. Not sure who was best, but I'm sure we can have time for both. <laughs> It's, um, first, I will say thank you very much for this speech. Um, and I must tell some things. I'm, I started to work political 20 years ago. And then I stopped because I didn't see any sense anymore. And then I started to live in communities because I thought if we finish, um, we will finish our living consuming if we find our resource in sexual being, in spiritual being, in being a community person. And I do this since 20 years and I like this work, but what I feel is that m many people, if they become spiritual or if they live in communities, they forget that they are political. And I, I am looking for meeting points like Fintorn or like we do in Tamera, where people can come together, where they can use their own source, and then think about how we can go back to society and really um, do a change. We must find our power though, so that people stop to destroy our, our earth. And also I'm looking for a way how we can tra and work with our youth so that they dare to say what they really love and what they feel. And so we should start, for example, schools for global learning, that they can see what is happening in, on our planet and that they really can feel their power to be radical, to change things. And for this I say very much thank you for this conference. Okay. Well, that thank was you. a commentary, that was not a question. <laughs> Thank you. You could pass it to your neighbour, yeah. Um, I would like to say um, a thank you to Christine for being such a wonderful role model of an empowered individual who can bring positive energy into any situation. I feel that's been a tremendous example. Thank you. Eu sou educadora há 38 anos e fiquei muito feliz com a palestra dos dois, de Cristina e de Zé. Eu juntei um pouco de um, um pouco de outro, mas a minha grande preocupação nesse momento é em relação aos educadores. She's been an educator for 38 years and uh, she's very impressed by the for the speech of the two. Uh, Lutzenberg and Christina, and she wants to know about uh, uh, how is the future for the educators. Essa preocupação vem da observação de como as coisas são conduzidas com as crianças. Eu tenho uma neta de sete anos que se alfabetizou desde os quatro. Ela está fazendo o que no Brasil a gente chama de segunda série do nível um e Uma semana antes de vir para cá, ela disse, minha avó, é, o que é atrevida? Eu disse para ela, por que? Ela disse, a minha professora disse que Deus criou o mundo. E eu falei para ela, 
Se Deus criou o mundo, quem criou Deus? Ela disse, cala a boca que você é muito atrevida. She's, she's concerned about the way children are educated in, in Brazil, in, in a general sense, because she's got a um, granddaughter uh, for, that has been educated, uh, self-educated since four years old, and today she's seven. And uh, she asked the teacher, no, the teacher in the school said that the world has been created by God. And she asked the teacher who created God. And the teacher said she was very daring. And um, she wanted to know what this word means. É urgente, urgentíssimo. O que podemos fazer para ajudar os nossos educadores? This is an urgency. And she wants to know what can we do for help our educators. Christine. Um, well, two words, may, very short. Maybe I'll go back to the to the example I gave about uh, Wabuya School of the Deaf. Uh, what what we discover is that uh, as much as uh, we are educators, teachers, and everything. Uh, what I normally say is that uh, the, 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 the future is, uh, it is us who will be in a position to give it a skeleton so that uh, maybe we leave the flesh to be filled in by the spring in such a way that uh, if the, the educators are there, they have the knowledge, yes, but they also need some workshops they also need some further feedback, some, uh, some further, some more information. But they just don't need the knowledge, the information that here you are, I've seen you've gone wrong here, so come to this workshop and learn this. No, they're in a, invited in an alternative way, a very friendly way, a way that uh, it will be like setting them free, giving them a different approach of freedom, maybe may, an unviolent way of setting them free and then putting the knowledge that you want to be put across to them in a very conducive atmosphere that will make them feel changed. The way when uh, we went to this school and later on we arranged for their own workshop, then they, they were educated, they accepted later on that there was chance to learn. So all we can say is that we need forums for our teachers so that we educate them about how we want our children, our grandchildren to be educated and maybe introduce forums in our education system like peace forums, non-violent forums, uh, theater forums, that kind of stuff. Then maybe like that, we'll be having a skeleton of our future, and then the spring ca can fill in the, the flesh. Thank you. you have also a couple uh, of words, I think, Very short us. remark, yeah. <laughs> if, I understood, if I understood you well, there was a, an acoustic problem there. You said that uh, when the child asked the teacher who created the creator, uh, she got, the child got the answer, this is a question that should not be asked. Is that correct? Yes. Well, this is the type of thing we do to destroy the genius in children. Yeah? There are questions that should not be asked. Then we close a switch in that child's head. Yeah? If we do not know an answer, what is wrong in telling the child we don't know? That makes the child continue thinking. So we must even be open enough to confess that we don't know and that we are faced with wonder, with a mystery. I recently found a very interesting book. You all know who Rachel Carson is. Yeah. Rachel Carson, the woman who really started the environmental movement when she criticized what was happening in modern agriculture with pesticides. 
Unfortunately, she, she died very soon, very young. She was, in, I think she was only 60 or so. And she was in the middle of writing a book with the title, How to Teach Your Child to Wonder. What a beautiful title. Como ensinar a sua criança a se maravilhar. How to teach your child to wonder. Uh, she died before she finished that book, but a young lady, I don't remember her name now, and a photographer took up her ideas and her, it's all written in, in a poetic style, and made a wonderfully illustrated book with Rachel's text and beautiful photography. And in this text, Rachel addresses herself to her nephew, a little nine-year-old boy, and makes him wonder about the wonders of nature. Very little of what we call education today goes that far. On the contrary, today's children cannot, mostly cannot distinguish an ant from a spider. And that is a calamity. That is a terrible disaster. We must open the minds of the children for the marvels of this great symphony of organic evolution, this fantastic process of life on this planet on, of which we are only a little part. Most of education does not give people that paradigm, that panorama. The modern economist, the modern engineer, the modern doctor or whatever, physician, they don't have that panorama in their head. The minute we know what incredible beauty this planet really is, what it means in, in, in terms of a true miracle, yes, miracle in the true sense of the word, organic evolution is the most fantastic thing. When we look at Mars, at Jupiter, at Mercury, they're all dead, but this is alive. This is an incredible jewel, and we're destroying it. We're not even making children realize what a jewel it is. This is Thank where you. education is going wrong. And much Thank change. You very much. Thank you.